Hello everyone, today we make a brief summary about medieval European culture. Um, we have a whole playlist dedicated to medieval society where you can find similar things. We made videos about written culture, uh, about medieval education. So there is a lot of, you know, of different branches of, of this you can find. This is just a, a very summary introduction, broader introduction to the thing that eventually you can expand in, in the others. And as you know, on Schwerpunkt we try so at this point to, to keep first of all the the essentials like if you want the manualistic guidelines to you know a general overview to a broader uh, presentation of medieval medieval history not only of course but in this case evidently um, so we will generalize because there is no other way to to, to make it fundamentally uh, that's what the vi other videos are for but also in this generalization, we will try to, you know, say to to give a bit more of depth um, to say, you know, the Middle Ages as such, renownedly never existed, and we uh, talk practically about um, an enormous amount of time and space that naturally varied dramatically for for a long time. We could find certain axioms, also approximate for, for that matter, saying, you know, certain areas, certain times, but uh, we'll, we'll stay to the essentials mainly. So, I, th I would think the first point is that in the Middle Ages, culture developed in an heterogeneous frame of different traditions that in many ways were dominated by the legacy of ancient culture by the pervasivity also of the Christian culture and also by the dominion of orality. Right. This is particularly important because they went in parallel in many ways. Ancient culture here is not just to be meant like classical um, uh, works for example or not even in fact a written culture. Orality had been uh, dominating also in, in ancient times. You will see how in uh, the early Middle Ages naturally of writing uh, decreased, the population grew less literate than it had been in the previous centuries. But uh, at the same time, you must give a you know fair, realistic uh, picture also of the ancient world that was you know definitely not enormously more literate, uh, and that it, it was it in, in in certain specific contexts and in a in a civilization that would grow actually. Uh, incomparable, comparable in uh, in um, dynamics, in measures, in quantities too, especially from high medieval times, right? And Christian culture, Christian culture at this point is definitely spreading, is is taking over. Naturally, in the early Middle Ages, this is not true for, for probably most of Europe in the sense that uh, Christian culture is also uh, related strongly to the Episcopal centers, as we will see now, and actually the same Christian society meant as mm, polities and, and these hierarchies that mm, ruled Europe in early medieval times were not excessively concerned about the actual Christianization. We could, we could you know, uh, imagine perfect terms that were yet to even be defined in uh, maybe not at this time, the essentials with the Nicene Council were, were set, but, you know, aside from the fact that um, for example, the, the the Eastern uh, world, the Byzantine world, for example, th this matters went on for for a while because also in early medieval times, uh, you know, heresies even, you know, took over at some point. It's from the same state. Um, in in this regard, we we should say that actually uh, Western Europe was was much more orthodox in in early medieval times than than Constantinople itself, right? And it was also more homogeneous to tell it all. The local st structures were were not, uh, in fact, capable of developing something mm, dramatically different or competitive, even with Christianity itself. Paganism never had a chance in this regard. Um, we, we shouldn't even see that as a struggle, as we are saying now. That the overwhelming amount of people at this point, obviously, believed um, uh, when this even was paralleled with with a Christian uh, creed and faith. Um, pagan, pagan, 
uh, stuff, let's say, um, and it was completely normal. It would remain. You can argue that you know it remained up to this day. You know, if, if you behave, if you believe, there are people who believe in, in astrology. I don't know, and uh, so they did at the time. It was not much of a problem, right? Uh, Christianity never disconfessed astrology, for example, per se, unless someone said, okay, you know, this, uh, you know, this part, the, the Bible is wrong because here this this other, you know. Um, Call the other system say otherwise. That that's where the problem was born, right? This was a problem chiefly not much of pagan legacy, but of the same Christian uh, heterodoxy, but not heresy. Uh, chiefly from the 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 twelfth century. Twelfth century was the great century of the heresies that risked in Western Europe actually to take over. Right? It was a concrete risk actually that would have not been uh, better um, and we discussed this a lot there is also a medieval christianity playlist in which we address these topics because uh, as always and you can easily see this as in you know in christianity as in islam right there has always been an orthodoxy a, a dominating orthodoxy and then a you know f um, a fringe um, let's say uh, an heterodox were not uh, schismatic or uh, heretical fringe right that always uh, conflicted and that can be um, the same pattern which can be observed in other contexts even you know atheistic ones right or um, that are reflect broader political and social dynamics that are coupled together with this I would say aptitudes rather than proper beliefs right the belief f follows uh, something something else usually um, and definitely the oral element here it's very difficult for us to to imagine a society that fundamentally does not rely uh, principally on written culture whereas that world especially in early medieval times it was really uh, like that and it was normal because Europe was coming from a largely um, mm, orally transmitted heritage and uh, the ancient world as we've seen had been the same right whereas written culture corresponded mostly to the rule to the elite in many ways still at this time uh, and um, a revival of the older uh, cl classical culture especially was promoted for example in the age of Charlemagne that revived the tradition of the Roman Empire first of all that it had never actually faded right Charlemagne didn't invent another empire right it just the means of you know how it was revived were, were controversial and you know something very peculiar that we also have discussed you know, on many occasions but it was substantially the same Roman Empire because in, in a Christian mindset there is nothing outside the Roman Empire right uh, an early medieval person thought um, in general especially in those contexts that were um, uh, we could say in the Mediterranean mostly but even those tribal you know, continental, even northern European context, the idea of the empire w was out there, right? Nobody had ever uh, forgotten the fact that there was still a, a legitimate empire that whichever was your your religious background, either Christian or pagan, right? And whichever your political stand had been, right? Even Scandinavians were aware of this. Um, it was the most powerful thing around, and therefore, uh, whichever god you believed there was out there was conferring this empire uh, a supernatural authority right so that was the enormous deal that uh, in Western Europe after the so-called fall uh, actually just of the Western administrative part of the Roman Empire um, everybody thought like okay let's re emulate let's emulate the Roman Empire let's assume the same titles the same forms because there, there is uh, the concrete possibility of um, of reviving it, or at least reviving what it's needed now to to exercise our authority more firmly, right? In the case of Charlemagne, this brought to the creation of a cenaculum of learned intellectuals of, co of court that led to a homogenization of um, Christian education in the empire, even of a common script, right? Um, in the also in the creation of a net of cultural um, um, let's say centers that were the monasteries that remain after the fall of the Carolingian Empire the cultural connective and not just cultural right connective tissue of of medieval Europe um, 
and that was eventually revived also by uh, under the Ottonians in, in a in a ever more universalistic sense, right? And also much more ideological one, and also in this sense more philologically and in fact linguistically correct, right? So these centers of learning, major major monasteries, abbeys, etc., scattered all over Europe, um, created uh, thanks to the Carolingian legacy properly a common European um, culture, especially in what would be today, in fact, it, it, I mean, the areas ruled by the Carolingian Empire that had a dramatic influence all around. Uh, this is uh, not just about, you know, continental Europe or uh, or Italy. This is also about all the countries that came in contact with Carolingians, uh, the Western Slavs, Scandinavia, uh, the the British Isles, um, of course, the Iberian Peninsula as well, right? And let's not uh, forget the the enormous in contribution not just Rome and uh, Romanic Italy uh, had, especially for the Carolingian Empire proper in reviving these forms of letters, etc. But also, especially in Ottonian times, the contacts between, uh, uh, in fact, Imperial Germany and the uh, the Caliphate of Cordoba in this, uh, let's say, Iberian Gallic. A corridor that is the one from which eventually even you know scholastic will be revived the st study of Aristotle the spread of many other technologies even paper mills etc so there is an enormous universe to to scope in here that however proceeded mostly from basically the Mediterranean towards towards the north and that kept uh, literally reviving with waves and waves and waves of models of culture, books, of people. Think about the organization of the church, how much it brought also in, in political institutional models to, I don't know, the, the Anglo-Saxon reality, or how um, the, the ecclesiastical administration per se that requires a, a skilled personnel, right? The, the Romano-Germanic kingdoms were fundamentally imitating the um, the ecclesiastical administration that, that was essentially the uh, the hair of, of the Roman one, of the imperial one. Sometimes quite literally, in the sense that at the regression of the imperial uh, controlling these areas, the representatives of the, uh, you know, of the empire, just from a cultural point of view, intellectually, were the uh, Roman, Romanized elites, right? They are the ones that basically educate uh, the Germanic ruling class and uh, mingle with, basically mix with them and produce what we know in fact as Latin Germanic Europe um, per se. And um, it were the same people. These people were bishops uh, a few generations ago. They were senators. They came from the same exact families. They were the same people, right? And they transmitted this knowledge further and more broadly, but also as we will see now, being influenced in turn by the barbarian culture and their tradition. Um, in the Middle Ages we, we cannot but mm, avoid to mention for example the rediscovery of Roman law right of the Emperor Justinian actually it was a real aberration of the Theodosian code that was undertaken in the universities of the uh, 11th to 13th century right that served eventually to the universalistic claims of the Swabian emperors. As we made a lot of videos about this, we even started a series on medieval law, which we have explained how uh, this uh, rediscovery was actually triggered by the same uh, intense intellectual development that was occurring in Europe, right? And that wasn't just a passive reintroduction of Roman law for no reason as an imposition, right? But it served basically to fill the gaps of uh, juridical tradition uh, that had fastly, you know, developed and articulated itself, and that was capable also an incredible flexibility. Um, it was um, stamped by the revival, uh, stamped from the revival of the uh, trade activities, especially in areas like Italy. The ju juridical, uh, the juridical revival, the discovery of Roman law is is from the Bolognese school, etc. The theology was mostly studied in this great other. Um, you know, uh, properly kingdoms of, of continental Europe, right? F first we have seen the, the Ottonians in Germany, but um, in this lower medieval centuries, uh, it's France, right? Northern France proper. Um, and, and Paris, the, the main center of theological studies. And the, in these would also get mixed, uh, thanks to the context between the, the Capetians and, and the Roman papacy. Uh, 
um, the same the discovery of Roman law was actually triggered by the struggle for investors, as we have seen. Essentially, the Germanic emperors wanted to reimpose the you know Roman juridical idea that the emperor was above um, above the church, actually com com could command the church. It was the only secular authority to be responded. The Roman papacy had instead started uh, its own uh, reforms, the Gr Gregorian reforms, that put um, the Roman um, papacy at the center in a basically monarchic sense. Um, of Christianity and uh, even in, in you know claiming uh, to even have the authority to dictate whether an emperor could be emperor and therefore what, what secular politics could be enacted or not on the base of a moral uh, superiority and it is this struggle that happens across all of Europe mostly investing Italy and Germany but from there spreading all over uh, this uh, deeply uh, intertwined uh, international scenario um, with France, with many other um, uh, powers that took part also in, in the struggle, to develop a, a dramatically, an enormous, and I stress here, enormous juridical, intellectual um, production, right? Even artistical one. There, there would have not been uh, a divine comedy as the, you know, as a pillar of Western civilization if there hadn't been a clash between the papacy and the empire. Um, this, uh, this, this struggle was uh, of, of uh, probably was one of the single most important um, uh, dynamics to that, you know, affected by Western civilization in this regard. And uh, this has to do deeply with the, with the same approach to the scriptures, the same Christianization of Europe that basically was able to separate for the first time the uh, the conscience from the action, the idea that it was not a merely contractualistic attitude but it was a, an active conscience that could uh, discuss individually the validity of authority and however on a base that had to be you know logically, mor morally um, uh, proven and that um, was uh, was in, in a constant politi political dialectic with the major universal powers. In Christian culture during the Middle Ages, the work of biblical ex exegesis, anthropological and philosophical reflection, of theological and ethical reflection was ininterrupted. Ininterrupted. The stimulus in this sense, in developing the, the, the very basis of what we consider even today the human rights, um, and uh, you know, uh, even lay principles, the the separation of church and state, the um, the 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 freedom of consciousness, right? It are basically seated in, in this very moment, right? It occupied um, uh, in ancient times. That started actually with the struggle between Christianity and the empire before the official Christianization of the empire uh, under the fathers of the church. Um, it, it eventually committed the learned. Um, ecclesiastics in the the, the, lear the learned clergy in disciplining the Christian society and to give also an answer to the religious worries. This was not just a religious phenomenon, it was a political and social alike. The fragmentation of Europe in this period n required in a way uh, an, uh, an ideal discipline that could compensate for the lack of um, political and institutional structures to impose that very organization and that's where that dialectic was refined right and it brought even to the emergency of uh, certain local prerogatives that were considered now as the same base by many um, uh, the of of the legitimization of a public authority, right? The, the universal powers naturally um, always preferred to see that you know a, a God-given right to rule was you know uncontestable. But that's the advantage here the European culture has is that the com all the various communities basically accepted this just in the measure in which, of course, th if they were able, their power in the early medieval times was very evident to accept. Uh, willingly whether they, they could be engaged in the system or not. And it was very advantageous definitely for the elites uh, and not only to, to get framing here and as we have seen the, um, the struggle between the papacy and the empire was also uh, in a way the, the same um, impossibility of a unique uh, imperial authority like there could be in China for example 
to pretend that its power was uncontested because it was constantly contested it was constantly put into discussion um, it was constantly uh, threatened right and there are important swings in here that also uh, characterize the the relation between the the Roman Church and and the what would be the Holy Roman Empire uh, that uh, could have taken other turns in this regard, but at the end of the day managed to balance themselves. Um, in this, as we have seen in the early Middle Ages, passing from antiquity to what we call to, to, to the Middle Ages, um, the capacity to write the um, memory and the transmission of knowledge. Um, were uh, largely entrusted to uh, oral culture, right? Written culture fell, right? Uh, in in f as a necessity, really, not because of an actual decline of um, you know of the capacities of these people to to actually learn it, but to the needs that they actually had to do it, right? The Germanic element the, the the barbarian populations who came to rule over western europe uh, brought in important elements of what also would be western that are still today in part um, uh, foundments of western institutions right um, for for a long time for example the uh, law was dominated more than the written um, laws per se by the so-called consuetudines right so from by the local oral traditions that organized the um, social relations and resolved the, the, the conflict the conflicts um, this is important because these consuetudines were constantly uh, transformed right think about uh, common law still today uh, how flexible it is and how it basically uh, derives from practice uh, its own uh, its own uh, doctrine and how this this can evolve and can adapt to the most different um, to the di most different cases. Well, this is part of that legacy, right? It's part of that legacy that, albeit you know, in, in countries of civil law, um, does does not exist anymore. Is still, however, uh, has still been uh, at the base of, of the wall Western um, of the wall Western juridical practice during the Middle Ages. All, all the countries in Europe were fundamentally under. Uh, the Christian countries of Europe under uh, what we would call common law, right? And even the revival of Roman law actually did not correspond to, um, you know, an impos a statal imposition to the customs, but just an integration, right? Uh, a point of reference that eventually evolved into, you know, something that modernity, the modern state, um, in its um, political and social needs, tra transformed into something else, but over a very long time, right? Uh, in this we should stress also the presence of an ecclesiastical law that developed in parallel to, to the civil one and that had similar, let's say, hegemonic um, you know, aims to the, to the imperial uh, law, right? And the very mm, specific history of, of the Holy Roman imperial uh, juridical tradition, and I mean political history, frankly, because and, uh, that is the point, right? There, there was a point at which Western Europe could have have could have seen a, an actual universe, actually a universal empire revived, right? The Hohenstaufen went pretty close to that in the 12th century. Um, the thing could have re replicated itself even in other historical contexts. A few ones telling the truth, maybe just one. But um, the uh, the point is that this fragmentation became the strength of Europe. Became actually one of the most solid and dynamic systems that favored the intensive um, uh, political, social, economical uh, development on, on a base it was constantly threatened, constantly under pressure, and that therefore had to find new effective um, and innovative, innovative means to, to go on, to survive. Um, oral culture was part of this, because oral culture allowed to essentially um, uh, modify for for um, for a while this um, the, the various customs of how they were coming to to develop and that's essentially how mm, the, those types of societies function without any other meat uh, 
the the, con the, the concept of regression of decline of uh, decadence is, is very relative in this regard. You must look at that society and ask what did actually serve to rule this and how much it would have costed to do something else and you know, if the answer is you know uh, the uh, ratio cost benefits is, is unfavorable you know, that that option is to be uh, crossed out uh, the same um, widespread very widespread um, attitude towards writing uh, of the during the Roman Empire especially the first and the second century AD um, even among uh, people of modest cultural and social conditions uh, definitely decreased uh, at this point um, however I would say that th there was a big change also in the way writing was actually employed the ancient world was very much uh, mechanically oriented towards writing it was not even reading what was not really how it, it eventually developed in middle ages which is actually pretty close to the one we do today right um, of writing in the ancient world was much more of a public um, uh, business even in, in the private transactions rather than, than an actual activity it was still seen as a, as a work as a mechanical thing um, educated people who had slaves didn't have to write just slaves wrote right in that sense um, because they were you know dictated what to do during the middle ages there is a much much closer approach to the litera, to the Britain word, uh, both for religious reasons, but also because of that for pulverization, say, of the political and social structures that brought the necessity for many people to, to approach writing in a, a much more, um, you know, functional, uh, if you want, um, more loaded, more uh, poignant way than it had been before, right? And the uh, the, s the grammars and uh, grammar and rhetorical schools had declined as well right after the the, f uh, the decline let's say of the cities and the dissolution of of the western half of the empire um, and this is being seen as a epical discontinuity right but um, if we look more closely at it f since the sixth century um, some schools began to be reactivated, right? Especially in the cities where those needs of literacy were, were greater by the episcopal seats and chiefly for the education of the clergy uh, and in the countryside by some monasteries for the beginning of uh, religious life and open, however, in some occasion also to the layman. Actually, early medieval education was much more easily accessible than it would become even later right it's just that less people cared about it needed it or you know you know you know the situation of uh, economical you know survival rate economy that's put in this way you know we would need to to actually get an education well naturally europe was different uh in its own uh times uh, in its own spaces even at that point uh the Mediterranean was more literate the north was at this point had not even been literate even right uh, uh, indeed the point though is that this didn't um, uh, uh, prevent the, uh, for one side the, the alphabetization of the layman especially of the aristocracy but at the same time it allowed fundamentally a free and a conscious approach to uh, education so ed education was not just um, you know, employed for a mechanical use, for a transaction, for something more um, pragmatic. It was a life choice, and and this was loaded naturally with much broader meaning than it had been in the past. This is unknown to the ancient world. This is most of it, right? And for many centuries, Western Europe um, so definitely the preeminence. Uh, in writing uh, to specialized clergy men and a few laymen that were capable of writing in a usually um, approximate uh, Latin and for just for some schematic private document usually uh, the preponderance of the ecclesiastical institution in determining the written tradition for example the historical narrative or doctrinary or literary um, works also thanks to the uh, to the 
in treasuring the, uh, the legacy of classical texts that were collected and passed down uh, by the by the monasteries was absolute. Let's say or almost uh, up to uh, basically all the eleventh century. Right, the kings were capable to emanate legislative texts. Um, yet, in general, there was a decay of the uh, writing of administrative and management character, and also the ones of private nature. This is not true everywhere, right? Orality, uh, you know, was always accompanied by some form of writing. Uh, orality fixed, you know, what here was lacking, right? But in many areas, actually, these activities were fairly intense for the time, right? There was a very good uh, literacy for, for those time standards, I don't know, in places like usually uh, Italy was probably the highest literate area, uh, at least in the Christian, uh, in Christian Europe. Um, the, uh, the other realities, naturally, in these great centers, especially the tr trade centers of the Mediterranean, definitely you can see um, a, a comparable um, attitude. In Central, Northern Europe, uh, it was different, right? It was different also because society was different, also because an aristocratic model was being imposed. So actually the social diversification wasn't very very high right there were just a few people at the top all the others had to work the land um, in areas that were more developed from a commercial point more active from a commercial point of view where the land distribution was more um, more equal let's say uh, there is a, a satisfactory amount of, of, of literates after all so actually uh, you never considered the Middle Ages ever like a, a moment where at some point Britain culture stopped. On the contrary, if you look more closely at it, we've done it in other videos, uh, you can see how th there was a qualitative improvement throughout all this period and that actually the, the so-called contraction or decline of Britain culture was very short. We're talking just about a couple of centuries, right? The thing kept improving over time. Um, the barbarian invasions led between the 4th and the 8th century to also to the death of Latin as the spoken language. Right, this naturally began uh, the earliest in the peripheral uh, areas of the former uh, western part of the Roman Empire, where actually Latin probably hadn't uh, even taken over the, the local, the local languages, the local uh, tongues. Um, but eventually, it, 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 this happened in central regions as Italy herself, um, where uh, the vernacular uh, began to, uh, to develop from Latin itself. Right? The spoken language assumed, in fact, original characters uh, up to generate between the 7th to the 9th century, the so-called Neo-Latin or Romance languages, such as French, Provencal or Italian, um, while it, in therefore you understand it the most Romanized areas um, and uh, of language of another stock like English or or, Germ uh, or German that had of course in in other areas that had a Germanic uh, character. Naturally, Europe is more complex than this. And there's a Celtic area, uh, also Slav uh, Slav is introduced many areas of after during the migration era. Um, the also Spain developed its own um, its own uh, Romance language with uh, the uh, you know, Arab influence um, as well, and we also have to bear in mind that uh, of course these languages hadn't developed as uh, you know homogeneously as we can think as Latin itself hadn't been spoken in the empire in an homogeneous way as we usually think, right? This transformation began. Uh, as soon as th the Romans conquered different lands, right? And the, the important element in this, I would say, is, is considering that the Romance languages spread in area, you know, remained, uh, you know, developed in areas that ha in ancient times hadn't spoken it. Think about the Celtic languages in, in Gaul, right? Um, or the, you know, the, the Iberian languages in, in Spain, right? These were areas of Western Europe that were probably Romanized and therefore began at the point so intensely they began to speak uh, a, a Romance language that is a modification of Latin right? and naturally maintaining parts of it, their former uh, legacy. 
and Latin remained, however, the language of written communication all over medieval Europe. Right? Um, th this is particularly important. And th this happened in virtue of the ecclesiastical monopoly of, it, of the educational structures, right? With the effect that the literates now uh, could uh, could not use in order to write a uh, language that they spoke, right? With the paradox that exactly in the moment in which the uh, political influence of Rome had been lost, uh, which is also relative by certain standards because Rome was basically for, for centuries, at least for throughout all the early Middle Ages, the single most important cultural center in Western Europe that kept spreading this um, enormous, um, you know, legacy of classical you know li models and, and and literacy and also ad as we've seen administrative models etc um, the dominion of latin culture was in fact th thus extended in areas that had not been even reached by the, the roman empire for, uh, for example ireland where latin was introduced by by monks right but this is true even for i don't know think about the saxons or the scandinavians right this was uh, you know, as soon as the, the areas were Christianized, you know, of course, that there we have a properly written, a properly written culture that corresponds to a very different political and social model was imported there, sometimes and largely actually developed by the same local people, so that largely actually Christianized themselves rather than got Christianized, never think that. Uh, most people in Europe were in post-Christianization. Christianiza uh, Christianization spread most of the times in conditions of, of strength that had basically not much to do with um, external threats per se, but were actually a uh, an autonomous uh, transformation of the local peoples. Right? It, it's easy to quote Saxony, but th that's kind of an exception in many ways. Nobody conquered Scandinavia and uh, Scandinavia got Christianized and began to write in Latin. Right? So, and this is this is pretty evident and reasons we have explained them at length on Schwerpunkt for hours and hours have to do with a different uh, a different reorganization of the local of the local world from the same locals. Uh, we're talking still about important clashes within the same communities. Um, this went in parallel with the development of that aristocratic model, right? But at the same time, it went in parallel with a general improvement of the life conditions of the social organization that the ecclesiastical hierarchy um, helped to discipline, right? The, the same fact that di a diocese, for example, has to build according to the Roman model into a city means that in places like the north, where cities had not existed up to that point, cities were built and together with them uh, a, a hierarchy, uh, uh, you know, clerks, uh, an administration, right? And this all was an incredibly profitable system for the elites to uh, give a new organization eventually to the countries of Europe as we know them today, right, that fundamentally emerged at this point for from them because largely previous to Christianization it wasn't even properly a, a, a real territorialization of power as such, right, that uh, different peoples lived like mostly as tr different tribes together in a kind of confederal state, um, the borders of which were were fluctuating constantly, where there was not a real center, was not a real stability. This helped even probably the, the middle classes to realizing that this was a more profitable mean after all, even if this passed through a general uh, impoverishment also of, of, of the same in relation to the aristocracy. That was a big deal, but what overall improved the, uh, the even the strength of those societies themselves. The kingdoms rise. Right, and these kingdoms are able to to defend themselves better, to develop certain important institutions, to to spread culture on their own. Right. Um, so, and even if impoverished and simplified compared to classical, to the classical one, medieval Latin was not a dead language, though. Right. The uh, scholastic and administrative reforms promoted in Carolingian times did not corrected many faults of uh, written Latin. Right, um, the clergy was usually multilingual. Right, uh, people were able actually to speak in Latin. 
was um, pretty common, right, to deal with. The, the, actually, the, the education of these people passed through the uh, the creation of a of a proper uh, Latin, uh, you know, the the easy use of Latin language, and um, overall, you know, a good half of Europe, especially the, the most populated areas, were as we have seen of romance, um, of romance tradition. So, actually, if we look at the main centers at this point of Europe in terms of just of um, political institutional development, take France, take Italy, take take Spain. Uh, that they're prevalent. I mean, the most of Europeans actually live there, and they they are on average wealthier uh, and more literate, and therefore they have also the chance to expand further this model, right? So this is uh, interesting because it, it's reflected at so many levels. Even the spread of urbanization. Take German. Germany has uh, an intense development in this period as well, chiefly from those areas that had been mostly Romanized, right? They spoke German in there, but still they had maintained a particular legacy that derived from the Roman times. The Rhineland, Bavaria, become the centers, in fact, of German culture and of generally the, the of institu political and institutional developments. There were the wealthier areas and so on. Um, so it, it's important to see how Europe revived around the High Middle Ages, also through the same pumping blood in the same older veins of what had been, even if transformed and modified, of the Roman Empire, the great road systems, the great river um, uh, way, highways, we can call them uh, properly, the Roman cities, and chiefly around the Mediterranean. Yet, in proportion, in areas of especially of Central Europe developed at this point with a much higher rate than the same Mediterranean ones during the Middle Ages. Take places like Scandinavia or Germany uh, as they were in the early Middle Ages and look at how what they were in the late Middle Ages. The, the transformation is, is astonishing, right, is astonishing. Um, the growth was much greater in there and that this that this has to do also with many others can be easily, easily observed even in northern France in in England that in part were had developed fundamentally um, in a in a more distant um, um, way from the Mediterranean countries their own identities and, and you know political and polities and um, uh, you know, traditions etc but that uh, also benefited from Carolingian times, usually, um, and by osmosis outside of the same Carolingian world, with the same Britain, of um, certain, uh, you know, transformations that had to do even with the land exploitation systems, uh, the revival of trade in 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 the in the North Sea, for example, in the Baltic Sea, uh, and you can easily observe how this air probably. Air Part of Western Europe contributed to to influence the uh, even eastwards. Think about great push towards the east, uh, you know, usually mostly led by the Germans or the same development of the Ansa. Um, the the trade the trade that began once again through Russia between Northern Europe and Constantinople during the Viking era. Th these are all important changes that are triggered in areas of Europe that previously were some of the most uh, you know, underdeveloped, and that at this point uh, had a substantial, a substantial uh, improvement and structuration that brought uh, to the development of also very important, um, you know, realities. Like think about the the English, the Anglo-Norman kingdom as such, right? And that was a product, if you want, of of Frankish culture, right? But it was still, nevertheless created in, in an area that had not seen a dramatic stability up to that point. It was developing actually its own very advanced administrative structures. Anglo-Saxon England had that, but that um, the, the Norman Kingdom gave even greater unity and, and center and stability and solidity. So to develop, in fact, uh, the Kingdom of England as we know it historically and uh, all its achievements in that regard. That came over time. It had uh, surely uh, an important uh, foundation in medieval times, without which we would have not known uh, of our past and the way we do, for not just for European but also 
world world history. Um, and um, the um, r cultural renewal of the 12th century, we made a two or three videos about it, um, that's that's quite quite overlooked in many ways. We I think in Western culture we have a great admiration for the Renaissance proper, the 15th, the, the 16th century, but the 12th century was the true moment of uh, and probably of, of greater revival in comparison even to the, the developments of the two centuries afterwards um, from the, the previous realities and as we've seen here after this important moment of gestation in early medieval times in a, in a completely different way, what we could really talk um, about a, a European, a common European culture, right? Um, dominated largely by Frankish uh, system, um, but not only. And um, developing especially a common philosophical um, commitment uh, and uh, now being solidly founded on a, on a net of uh, centers of culture and of power that uh, were uh, truly of European scale that uh, spoke the same common language uh, in Britain culture that had the same even literary models and even ways of writing right and and that could therefore facilitate dramatically the uh, share of uh, this culture throughout all uh, all this world. Uh, humanism eventually readopted uh, uh, the, um, these models in a way, uh, or at least developed them further, right? Uh, but the attention for, for example, for classical authors um, as a rhetorical and stylistical method were pioneered uh, during the 12th century in an unprecedented way, in a way that didn't look at the um, ancient times I with inferiority complex, but was able to laugh at it, to transform it, to f uh, to adapt it to its own society. Um, that was an enormous achievement that the, the, the humanism in this sense didn't quite have in the same way, or at least it had it in a measure in which it was able to inherit from, from this previous properly medieval civilization that Flourish between the, the, the 12th and the 14th century uh, before the crisis of the Black Death, of the economical contraction, etc. It was a huge civilization in the middle of the Middle Ages that we have lost also in part because we don't really even know how, how big it was, right? And eventually was reshaped in a humanistic and kind of more elitistic sense. But uh, what we know as the Renaissance of the late Middle Ages is mostly, in fact, an elitistic and also um, largely imitating. Um, type of culture, right? That doesn't render just, I mean, what we see of the surface of the Renaissance is mostly what was built on a base that had been consolidated in previous centuries of practice, of shared culture among even, and, and, and science of techniques, uh, among, you know, the masses, right? And think about the corporations, think about um, medieval engineering, logistics, uh, military transformation. That th the, the Renaissance took as a you know, as a base to eventually imitate uh, cla the classical past, because that was their objective, but improving that even in turn, because it was not a mere imitation of the classical past, but because it had been enriched by the base of medieval, with the base of medieval civilization. Um, uh, at this point, Europe had by far surpassed uh, ancient civilization. The end of the Middle Ages, the fall of Constantinople, the uh, the arrival of this other wave of uh, of uh, Hellenistic and uh, Arab um, works from from the East was not the thing that triggered the Renaissance, right? The Renaissance is the the the, the fulfillment of medieval civilization, right? And what the Europeans do in the late centuries um, of the Middle Ages is simply to read what Ancien had done from a, a condition that could allow them to integrate this knowledge in, in a much broader one like the European was at that point. So uh, the Renaissance is not an accomplishment of the ancient world, it is a fully an accomplishment of medieval civilization that by the 12th century at the latest was at least a, as advanced as the, the ancient one.
right as the western world by the way was by the 12th century basically reaches and surpasses the same uh, a byzantine and arab one from a um, scientific technological accounting military point of view i mean the, uh, the these dwarves remain very very similar but the qualitative change that was accomplished in, in 12th century western europe was the city that managed largely I, I was asked recently you know the, the idea of you know why is the west the west right I'm, I'm not a great fan of the idea that you know there is oh, a west right that there would be a huge lot to talk about this where is what, what is western proper uh, in that sense of course it doesn't mean anything like not even as eastern not even as you know that there, there is an enormous debate on, on this stuff but properly if we look at modern europe if we want to identify objectively uh, an important um, si modern system that by the end of the modern age would f fundamentally come to 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 dominate the world um, in a, in a even an aggressive but a, you know still an effective mean we have to look in my opinion at this very centuries of the middle ages because in a, a broader historical perspective uh, if you look at the the civilization that developed in Europe between the 12th in the mid of the 14th century, about 80 cathedrals built. I mean, uh, uh, an enormous, an unprecedented thing, right? The, the Roman Empire was nothing like, in, in terms of sheer um, time of accomplishments, that there is no comparison, right? This stopped in the mid 14th century, and the impression I get is that it, 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 with the big crisis, this thing contracted once again, but it was so solid that it didn't wasn't wiped out. Like instead, ancient um, civilization basically crumpled with the crisis of the especially of the sixth century of the great pandemics and it developed further in what late modern culture actually was from these very bases right and um began to, to be the west as we realize it naturally there, there were lots of other factors in the meanwhile the ottoman invasions were probably in the early modern age one of the most dramatically important uh, factors to the shaping of of a, in the narrow sense at least of what we call today properly Western Europe like the, the Western Europe as uh, properly an area of Europe um, uh, and that the one who stood you know against the Ottoman Empire um, but uh, at the same time uh, the I think the essentials here were found and they passed through some important dramatic change the, the Carolingian world definitely had a huge impact the Carolingian world failed politically militarily right but it didn't fail socially it didn't fail um, e uh, educationally uh, that was a massive accomplishment the other thing was definitely the clash between the the, um, the papacy and the empire and the, the in parallel the revival of Roman law that was also probably one of the most dramatic in impacting phenomena in, in Western civilization, defining moment in Western civilization. Um, definitely what in went in parallel with that as a dramatic, uh, even more dramatic, commercial, in fact educational, technical, uh, intellectual development of Western Europe, right, during the, especially the, the 12th, 13th century. It was astonishing literally astonishing um, and this is the moment where we can't see even the, di the diversification of Europe this is probably one of the single most important characters of European culture its diversity the fact that Europeans were able to essentially decline their own culture it was as we've seen a common one right there cannot be a nationalistic denial of the existence of a common European culture um, we are Europeans for a very, very long time. Nationalism has come to, to destroy, actually, with secularism and th this radical, absolutistic obsession towards essentially a very low and immediate thing, like, you know, the identity of just, you know, essentially what you look like or what you speak, because it gets down to that, um, to a world that had managed to see itself in a universalistic term nations look just at themselves European civilization during the Middle Ages looked at the universe and managed to dominate it intellectually right this is the different sheer difference of uh, quality of civilization between us and the Middle Ages that most people don't don't, don't get at all um, 
uh, the, for example, the economical development of the cities, right? The medieval cities are, is a enormously more dynamic uh, one than, than a Roman one, right? It, for, first of all, it's much more populated. Um, and don't quote me Rome, because Rome was a, you know, a capital that lived mostly with this kind of, uh, I don't want to use parasitary term, but it didn't produce much on its own, right? It was like masses of people at that gravitated around it. We don't even know exactly how many there were, saying one million inhabitants. It's, yeah, possible, but also debatable. But there is no comparison with the urban net in, um, in Roman times and its population with the one of the Middle Ages. Um, the uh, monarchical and communal powers that affirmed also this point um, s sedimented, uh, consolidated this, th those territorial um, entities we have described before, right, on the essentials we have described before with a firm territorialization, with an administrative system, um, with a, an instrument of control, the development of armed forces for a, used largely as a deterrent to keep the populations obedient and mm, you know, ensuring um, low to be respected trade to, to go um, without, without delay. Right? Um, these realities began to create new educational institutions that were not anymore directly controlled by the church, right? Uh, these were not lay institutions as we can think of, like as completely devoid, right? The church always, um, I think in the Middle Ages properly state and church were separated, uh, but they were separated within the Christian unity. So you cannot talk even about lay institutions um, as you know not subject to the ecclesiastical control this was present everywhere and the reason why it was present is that the same control uh, made the the work of the people who had created those institutions um, the the same church actually took uh, a lot and contributed to for example the development of universities per se some of the most ancient universities in europe uh, were founded by the church, other were founded by the emperors, other were instead founded by the local um, communities, by the communes, for example. Um, but the important element in here is that um, there is a development of private and public um, authority foundation. We're talking about foundations, um, grammar schools, where they obviously you, you learn to read, um, schools of apprenticeships, uh, think about the one organized by the merchants and the Guildsmen, uh, universities, as we have uh, seen, were uh, besides uh, developing the basic early medieval set of of, of uh, subjects of the liberal arts, uh, essentially sciences of language and of nature, and also theological speculation, began to form also, for example, the uh, specialists of law, judges, notaries, lawyers right, and the clerks, the bureaucrats employed in the administration of the kingdoms, right, bureaucracy uh, is not something that is born in 18th century France, um, bureaucracy is created in uh, 13th, 14th century France and, and Rome and the papacy, right, the, the great, uh, especially after the fall of the, of the, uh, of the Orange Staff and the fragmentation of the uh, say of the German power in uh, the mid uh, in the second half of the 13th century bring to the, this great axis that will dominate Guelph Europe for first centuries was fro between France and Italy right Paris Avignon Rome Naples these were uh, essentially major uh, centers of properly bureaucratic development that's where modern bureaucracy starts from. Never, never, uh, you know, follow the Vulgata that looks at modern Europe as essentially uh, something new that was created, that the Middle Ages hadn't accomplished. It's the other way around, right? Uh, the modern world is based, is, is essentially homogeneous to the, to, the, um, to the medieval one. It's the same one. Right, it just brings to this progressive centralization that had actually already started during the Middle Ages. Right, it's just that the modernists, on average, will tell you no, because centralization proper began 
uh, in, in the modern age. It doesn't make sense, right? If you, w if you want to look at an absolutely centralized model, you have to wait in 1805 with the Code Napoleon. All that you see uh, before that is, is a mix, is a hybrid. There is a minimal centralization that you can find literally in every single early uh, medieval polity as well, where you don't have to wait the 16th century, that increases slightly. Yeah, look at national monarchies during the Middle Ages, the great work of centralization, of territorial control, the encastellation. Um, actually, more the encastellation was, you know, kind of widespread uh, autonomous local phenomenon. Modern uh, uh, national monarchies begin to, to reorganize this, to, to build more, um, uh, to think more strategically and territorially that, that our powers had done before, right? And in order to make this work, there is obviously bureaucracy needed, right? That is not created in in the modern age. Ambassadors are not created in the modern age, right? Um, the, um, the There is this myth we have that it's all filtered throughout, throughout the, the modernistic, enlightenment, technologistic, uh, mm, progressistic idea that, that all of a sudden the Renaissance arrived and everything changed. Garbage. Uh, everything that the Renaissance was reasoning true was already there in medieval times. And I don't even think that medieval thought was so uh, dogmatic, uh, univocally, you know, um, uh, doctrinary. Uh, it's about this we should make lots of other videos actually because it's, it's not easy to explain directly. But uh, what you see in the Renaissance is uh, a, a greater reorganization, a greater uh, uniformation. Right, this is the, the greatness of the early modern age. This is what actually happens. And the Renaissance is a medieval product. Um, also, the uh, renewed literacy of laymen, right? This began in this 12th from 12th, 13th century, right? The massive alphabetization, actually, of, of laymen, right? Certain areas of Europe, even the peasantry, in part, was, was literate. Um, there is often in some manuals I have seen a kind of north centric uh, attitude towards Middle Ages. The fact that we have often, like, we think of the Middle Ages essentially as 15th century England, right? Just know that that's not the point. And that Northern Europe for most of this time was in fact lagging behind compared to, to, to the continent um, and the rest of the continent. And uh, a much greater advancement had taken place already in some areas. So this is also part part from which also these positivistic uh, ideas were born historically. Like if you look at the 18th to the 19th century, there were important ideological reasons also in terms of, you know, um, contrast between various nations, also colonialism and also racism that was developing as a pseudo scientific, you know, measure of environment of history. Um, well, this this is where the prejudices towards also the medieval, the accomplishment of medieval wars actually stem, right? Because at that time there was a, a radical obsession to um, to to stress the uh, the modernity and the detachment and the separation from the allegedly obscurantistic papist uh, world that had you know. A we we talk of the scholastic. In fact, as we were saying before, as this also the same foundation of Roman uh, of, of 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 human rights, of of the um, combination of of, of science uh, and faith. Uh, that today w I don't know why the the, the thing has to be f seen as diametrically opposed. When they're actually simply at the two different levels, um, and. This is all a burden, a great intellectual deficiency that we bring um, uh, as a, we carry as, as a burden since, in fact, the 18th to the 19th century. Right before that, there wasn't properly that attitude, and it was a, a much more uh, medieval um, open-mindedness and, and, and mental flexibility than before. And this has nothing to do with trying to force like fate into science. Like this is properly the mistake, right? It's it's conceiving that, um, you know, it, the, the delusion of pretending that, that humanity is wholly rational, right? Uh, the, think about the doctrines of the homo economy. We have surpassed them completely 
right? We realize today that the two things coexist and have always coexisted, and that if you want to enforce these principles uh, on a healthy minded person, you will get a schizophrenic, right? And this is, in fact, exactly what, I in many ways, um, certain movements even p produced. But one looks at scholastic and says, what would be Western civilization without scholastic? Um, we've talked about it uh, a few days ago, we made a video on it. Um, this is the problem we have. We have, remo we have wanted to remove the Middle Ages fr w from our cultural legacy in many ways, or revive it for either nationalistic, that is, very narrow-minded purposes, um, it basically denying the greatness of medieval civilization. Uh, um, the layman, the role of layman in this regard is very important. The Middle Ages were not dominated by the clergy. Right? The, the, there was a universal culture cooperating one with another. Right? The uh, laymen were involved from the centuries onwards, the 12th, uh, the 13th, um, in the, the, the economical affairs, in the activities of government. Right? And this brought to another phenomenon, a new phenomenon, that is the put into writing of the maternal language for practical necessities and for private use. You know, we talk about vernacular, right? It's an adjective that is referred to the tongue that initially um, was the one spoken by the, the people. Actually, the better term I, I use it would be vulgar, um, that, it, you know, in other, you know, vernacular actually comes from verna, that uh, is home-born slave. Um, vulgar comes from vulgus, that means people, right? Um, it is also more common to, I mean, to more European uh, languages, actually. Um, so the vulgar that is counterposed to Latin, right? As it's um, the, as we have seen, the language of writing and of culture. So the vernacular language are definitely, as we know, as the um, origin of the modern ones, and they constituted themselves since the low Middle Ages, they own um, corpora of literary texts, right? The history of the transformation of vernacular into written languages is of dramatic beauty, and uh, we will have to make some philology video at some point, because, um, like, um, every country developed this in a different way, right? In Northern Europe, for example, the, the passage was much easier, because um, people didn't, I mean, Latin was much less uh, spread uh, among the population. These people had never spoken even a Roman la a Roman's language, so they simply began to write and to sing. Uh, th th or, or naturally, everything stems from oral traditions. Well, these are people who decide to put into writing things that they sang from, I don't know, from thousands of years. Think about the I mean, thousands, you know, yeah, centuries at least, but that had much older roots. Think about German epics or um, or the, 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 the sagas. Um, and that's where the, from which the vernacular literatures emerged. Uh, the most famous are definitely the law of poetry, a chivalric culture that had within themselves uh, a great uh, cultural legacy, as you understand. Think about the Britonic cycle, so even in there, if you want the minority element of European um, cult culture and identity at that point, coming from the Celtic fringe, from the Celtic past, that, however, was revived in uh, in uh, in the Western Frankish world, in, in the Langue d'Oil, in, in this romance context that produced uh, the Chanson de Geste, that all these court literature that bec became fundamentally the dominating literary form in Western Europe. It was imitated chiefly in, in, in uh, Italy, in, in Germany. Um, it drew in, in turn a lot also from other areas, from, from Spain, for example. Um, Spain at this point was, a, was literally a well of, uh, of knowledge, of culture, of traditions um, in certain important schools like Toledo, uh, both m during Muslim and, 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 la and later uh, Christian times. Uh, this is the area where the, r the rest of Europe went to find manuscripts, where to learn more things. There is this broader, let's say, Visigothic legacy in between northern Spain and uh, also a, a big chunk of today's France, actually, that is Aquitaine and uh, this this broader area that 
of the south of Occitane that had much more related in many ways to, to, to the southwest rather than to the north that produced the where the, you know, the literature flourished right this whole immense um, uh, world heritage of uh, chivalric about the troubadoric literature uh, had massive impact all over the other national literatures think about Sicilian uh, poetry um, that was uh, uh, stretched across Sicily and Germany uh, in, in Swabian times think about uh, the Tuscan um, language from wi in literature, Dante, Petrarca, uh, Boccaccio, etc., that eventually created I Italian literature. Think about the Minnesänger in Germany that created German literature proper. Right. So um, Europe, uh, in broader terms, had had owes this. Uh, a peculiarity, this uniqueness to this. Uh, radical share and intensive um, readaptation and elaboration and original synthesis of an enormous set of uh, of, uh, of cultural legacies uh, in turn right um, there couldn't be Europe wi without these parts of Europe as such right this is the the, the sad realization we do today when you see that by 2020 there is not really properly a, a European Union worth of this day uh, w and while we ha we have in our past this uh, natural uh, legacy and connection and uh, this is um, uh, incredible to say the least the, the, this divide between Europeans doesn't doesn't seem to be uh, diminishing it seems rather to, to be increasing right we and great part of this is because of the radical ignorance and gross underschooling actually of the average Western person like uh, even if we are um, definitely the most educated people in the world and there is no debate about this still this is the standard realization this is why we should talk about this reality is because if we do not understand this specific past we are useless citizens, we are useless individuals, we are useless minds. So there is nothing to be proud of being born in one place if you don't even know its history. And this is true for basically, on average, every single people in the world. And I find it criminal, personally. There is also another overwhelmingly important aspect that we discussed recently in this uh, world of uh, Britain uh, culture expansion that is the presence of women capable of v writing right not just of reading right as you know women were especially in the aristocracy were generally educated but at this point the same form uh, the women as you know were mostly relegated uh, compared to men in education but the from the 12th and 13th century this uh, gap be begins to decrease there will be uh, still a lot of way to go, like a good 700 years uh, up to the 20th century, up to um, up to the point that the, the gap would be filled, at least in, in the Western world, and there's still a reason why this is the case, probably. Uh, once again, there's nothing teleological in here, right? The same could have happened theoretically even in the, I don't know, in other worlds, but the, the point here is that if this, you know, if in the 20th century the Western world was the first to fill that gap, much was owed also to this period in history, uh, to the 12th and 13th century, right, where women began to access, not just not just to be more educated, um, but in fact to be allowed. Uh, sometimes we know actually of, uh, of female teachers, even in universities, we have plenty actually of evidence of this. Uh, of course this has nothing to do with, you know, the trying to think everything was like uh, that they could do everything because they were actually prevented from doing it. But at the same time, this shows that there is a new attitude. They renewed. Look at uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. A look at architecture, sacred art, the role of the Virgin, uh, of the Madonnas, the, uh, the 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 hymn to motherhood, for example. Um, the you know there are certain you know paintings. Uh, look at Giotto. I don't know. I've with uh, with a mother with a child, the point is not even important that it's about 
uh, Christianity that it's about Mary and Jesus. That is to be a, a celebration, an end to motherhood of, of mothers with their children, right? And this is um, sung uh, like a hymn in Western civilization. This is what our identity, what our image, a mother with a child, our civilization stands for. Um, and uh, this is a, a deep root. Uh, this is, uh, we can't look at the, the even try to, to calculate about the the overwhelming, just sheer quantity of, of sacred art portraying this. I, I think a, a good tenth of you know Western civilization is based on sacred art depicting the virgin with a child. Look, look at every you know museum in the Western world and how much there is of that. And and this is a, a deep cultural character. This this stems from a deep uh, reflection, even on the role of the woman, um, and her uh, her. Uh, centrality right in, in Western civilization so uh, this is also other food for thought um, then we we have we mentioned architecture this is also important because to the cultural renewal of the Carolingian age that was characterized by the imitation and value of classical forms uh, there were also other uh, let's say uh, culturally homogeneous periods that we mostly study as such in art but that corresponded actually to, to different ways of thinking and looking at the world of the universe and the role of mankind within it. Um, between the 10th and the 12th century there was the spread um, of the so-called of the 19th century called say better Romanesque right that was the outcome of the uh, economical revival and also of the monastic reforms uh, that began to build in, in in set right with a specific pattern was replicated everywhere um, this enormous spread of monastic holdings and and, and power uh, that was characterized in architecture at least by this massive stone buildings inspired to the Roman ones so that's where all hence Romanesque uh, with the presence in the church of massive mm, supporting pillars uh, of cross bolts um, and of reduced spaces for the windows, right? There was all, um, you know, a theological, I mean, at least a um, uh, divine conception in, in, in this, in the role of the faithful and um, even in the, uh, you know, in, in the different forms of uh, expression, even of the painting, etc. Uh, we don't have the time now to, to express it, but they had fundamentally to make the, the faithful concentrate mostly on the on this teaching, on this visual teaching of the internal um, uh, paintings, uh, frescoes, and um, kind of sheltering the faithful from, from the outer world, as in a is in a negative, um, you know, vision of the world, in a dramatic vision of the world, uh, to which was accompanied also to these erratic, um, uh, divine uh, representations that express m more, you know, fear and uh, authority than, than actual, you know, benignity uh, as such, right? And um, this had was also characterized by a rich or school sculptural ornament in the portals in the capitals that also reflected still this this mysterious world this if you want even the grotesque one um, that uh, eventually was put outside as you know by gothic but that also was a legacy of the pagan past um, in many ways if you want even a, of, of secular culture um, of, of elements of marble etc of a world that was still you know wandering about itself in these years instead Spreading from f uh, northern France since the 12th century as an artistical language of the French monarchy and uh, uh, called by the humanists eventually uh, as Gothic because you know it was an insult actually um, because it allegedly referred to the symbol of uh, medieval universalism and um, and therefore to something barbaric but the humanists in this sense at least uh, were <laughs> you know were jerks. Um, uh, this was actually Gothic is the so-called Gothic is the portrayal of, uh, in fact, of, of that universalism we're talking about before. A Gothic cathedral owns within itself 
scholastics, right? Uh, the understanding of, 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 of the world of cosmology, of science, um, of morality, right? Of, uh, of a model, of a symbol that is, is uh, uh, you know, observing actually the world I from a totally different perspective. It's abandoning the classical models and privileges this uh, uh, stretching towards the, the, the sky, right? And so it's an elevation, it's a moral elevation, it's a moral discipline um, uh, that expressed by the buildings has a very specific relation with light. Uh, it's the same walls that emanate light in Gothic, right? And um, uh, that let light in, uh, that uh, essentially have to make the faithful exp uh, express this uh, sense of, of greatness, but in an inclusive way and in an elevating one. Uh, in this space of, uh, you know, where, where the, s the, the whole universe can be contained, in which mankind is at the center of it, together with, uh, with the human nature of Christ. Um, and it's the triumph of light, actually, uh, through this uh, stained glass in the church, and in a, also in a more naturalistic uh, vision in the reality of painting. Right. Uh, this is very important as well, because there is a, um, a renewed interest towards nature, but not in that um, you know, mysterious and imprescrutable way that remains uh, fundamentally in medieval civilization, but, but now interpreted in a in a in an anthropological sense, where the, the mankind is at the center of an intelligible world that must be represented, that must be, um, uh, you know, th that is limpidly uh, uh, described and observable and it, it doesn't um, it requires an effort that goes in parallel with that ethical improvement but that is possible to achieve and this gothic was uh, adopted by the roman church as its um, fundamental model that that's the center also of that uh, french uh, italian alliance as we've described before that after the fall of the Hohenstaufen was dominating europe and uh, that's the reason why um, it was imposed everywhere in the late Middle Ages as the courtly style, right? Distinctive of the chivalric nobility of the urban patriciates, right? And um, it's only um, at the moment of contraction of of this um, of of this great civilization developed between the twelfth and thirteenth century that actually humanism rose, like in 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 Italy in the, in the fourteenth century. Um, um, there was this uh, systematic uh, reproposal, uh, proposal, let's say, of the recovery of the um, ancient models and culture that eventually, with the fall of the universal powers, with the contraction of the Holy Roman Empire, the same, um, the same Roman papacy, uh, and that eventually resulted in the artistic renaissance and in scientific and technological innovation were capable of um, you know opening to a new stage of European and global power. Um, to this vision naturally we must always be um, very cautious in finding certain moments of beginning and of end. As we were saying before there is a flow right the, the, the Middle Ages never existed as such, the ancient world never existed as such not even the modern ages exist as such, even less so the contemporary one. So it's a constant flow of re-elaboration of a knowledge, right? At this point, essentially between the ancient and medieval world, not much was um, changed in scientific terms, right? And just maybe the Middle Ages improved optics uh, as such, as a scientific innovation, but basically technological knowledge was, was exactly the same. Um, you know, from compared to the ancient world, naturally from the Renaissance, science begins to make important mm, steps forward, but still in a mostly in a theoretical conceptual terms, right? That had been founded, as we've seen, medieval times, and that would take also a couple of centuries before reaching to the so-called scientific revolution, and therefore uh, adopting new technologies for solving other problems by what it had emerged only at that point you you wouldn't you wouldn't for example uh, 
have a scientific revolution without colonialism. Uh, you uh, without all this immense amount of of um, of capitals that were imported to Europe and that needed new new technologies now because manufacturers were not able to to uh, they would have gone wasted otherwise. So hence uh, it's not strange to to think the steam engine would was affirmed that was known since ancient times actually but found the the adequate amount of componentistic in a market and a you know effective field of employment in 18th century england right uh, and without the indian cotton right uh, imported on mass and the english manufacturers would have not had the problem of creating and developing further for you know this industrial revolution so uh this is the way we should reason uh, like, right? It, it's not really technology that changes history. Technology is just a tool that people use to do something. And if those people don't know what to do, don't have a need to do it, uh, technology doesn't develop, right? So uh, it's frankly ridiculous to, you know, to hear still those things like, ah, you know, the Romans didn't trigger, you know, um, um, uh, industrial revolution for other reasons, also because they, they their mindset was set on slavery, like uh, like yeah, the, the world world's mindset at the time was set on slavery. Why should have the, the Romans or anybody abandon that? If, you know, considering the, the amount of potential and the componentistic that existed, at it, how what would have been the the, the outcome of you know with, with those social economical balances to to invest in steam engines for which they would have starved to death. Uh, you know, millions of people in order to to, to be <laughs> become functional when 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 metals were still something you know pretty damn precious and you know let let's be serious when we talk about history, please. But aside from that, um, I would like to open just a small excursus on the written documentation of medieval times in this sense because I think. Um, it's even more meaningful to understand where this formamentis in fact stemmed from and how we can study it, how we can really understand better than other aspects how um, a mindset changed on the base of what is produced, right, as a source and especially in written culture. So, as you know, the, uh, the scholars um, reconstruct the past through the witnesses that uh, remain and that have arrived up to. Uh, to us, and s such witnesses are uh, indicated with the term of sources to uh, address basically their nature of, in fact, of springs of knowledge for history. And the principal sources for the study of the Middle Ages are definitely the written ones, right? Uh, albeit, uh, you know, very important, especially for early medieval times, are also the material say once uh, you know that you know even in a in a manuscript you you can study it paleographically or codicologically right paleographically you really study how it was written um, and that you can from there even get into the philological and linguistical aspect literary aspect of it etc codicologically speaking you study the manuscript as a mm, as a piece of archaeo as an archaeological find right so you can get different, uh, naturally the two subjects are intertwined, but um, let's say that the, the greatness of the of the Middle Ages stands in this literal explosion of written source. So, um, uh, when we talk about, for example, archaeological sources, we, we can't space for, for a substantial time, especially when written culture, in fact, didn't exist in some uh, areas. Um, we also have, um, however, uh, written sources in archaeology. We have seen even the manuscripts can be considered as such. But think about epigraphy, uh, right? Uh, with writings that basically are exposed to open spaces, uh, coins, right? Um, also seals, uh, emblems, uh, works of art, and uh, also iconography. They are quite important. However, the written sources express a greater, an ev even greater variety of typologies, and we used to call them with the term of documents. And uh, these can be um, the witness or the proof, for example, of agreement or a fact with juridical consequences, but also the documentation of a culture, of an ideology, of the relations between people and powers. Right. So, uh, 
think about um, uh, diplomatics, right? Uh, that uh, studies especially this is aspects. So the Middle Ages constitutes undoubtedly a documentary age, uh, because it's the moment in history from which from we we get. Uh, um, a, a, an enormous amount of sources that surpass scholarly in a you know incomparable way the ancient times right and naturally in proportion uh, you know medieval documentation is pretty low for let's say contemporary times but that is not the point it's not a race between which age produced the most of you know which age actually you know has been better preserved or not but it's rather about understanding the importance that written documentation, both public and private, or solemn or simple, um, had in the societies of these roughly 1,000 years. So as we've seen, the production of documents was relatively scarce, scarce during the early Middle Ages, so much in fact that we study it more like, in terms of sources, more like the ancient world, right? chiefly through archaeology. Um, and as we have seen, this is connected to the levels of literacy of a society, right? Some peoples in Europe still being mm, basically literate. So, uh, with the affirmation of monarchies and the com and communes, as we've uh, seen before, the centralization of the pontifical powers, for example, and the uh, multi general multiplication of the governmental institutions determined instead the uh, widening of the documentary activity uh, in the low medieval centuries. Especially the chanceries had uh, a, a great role in, in catalyzing this process. The chanceries, uh, as you know, are the, this office deputed to the writing and the validation and even to the emanation, of course, of uh, acts of generally a lay um, authority, right? Um, in the, the empire, kingdoms, principalities, communes, or um, also ecclesiastical ones like the papacy or the bishoprics. So in the early Middle Ages, the chanceries were monopolized by clerks, even if they actually represented um, uh, secular powers and chanceries are very important uh, for the political institutional development because they often mark, in fact, the, you know, they often um, uh, show the uh, level of development of a specific polity. For example, Anglo-Saxon England had um, fairly early uh, chancery development. After all, in London, then is a, in this sense, a more properly, you know, an older and truer capital than, than Paris, for example. So don't think that even less developed powers cannot have more advanced um, uh, uh, centralized institutions, right? That there is a reason for that. I mean, you can't compare the Carolingian Empire to, 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 to the Anglo-Saxon England at that point, but still the Anglo-Saxons were more centralized, let's say, ideally, at least in terms of common, uh, of those customs we're recalling before and their, you know, gradual attempt towards a territorial and kind of central government that um, a more sedentary one at least than uh, the Carolingian world that was literally on horseback all the time so that there were many capitals and none of them was a true center right Paris developed as such uh, since an early, it was always important also in early medieval times but it, you know think about Aachen even the foundation of new centers um, the attempt of it, think about Aachen, the, yeah, it was funded by Charlemagne, it had to be in theory the capital of the Carolingian Empire, eventually, you know, it became a, uh, I mean, an important city for medieval standards, but still mm, a secondary one compared to many others, and still the center of, of uh, actually nothing in that regard, not even in Carolingian times. Um, so, as we were saying before, with the development of the papal power of, of the monarchies, of the communes. Since the 12th century, the widening of this daily service of registration, copy and preservation of the documents triggered the employment, the growing employment of notaries, secretaries, lay scribes, so that process also of licitation of the scribes in and uh, corresponding naturally to the spread of literacy among commoners uh, at this point. Uh, and 
so chanceries of kingdoms of the papacy of um, the peripheral administrations on, on the territory uh, the urban offices be began since the 12th century the great centers of production of coherent writing by the way for practical use right the the history of paleography is very fascinating uh, I hated paleography when I was at university because uh, I didn't do well you know apparently I was told I had a good eye for it but I you know I was terribly lazy at, at learning you know the definitions so I kind of sucked but um, it's actually very beautiful one day we couldn't even you know widen the, the, the topic maybe I, sh I sh could make other videos about I made I made a video on polyography just stating how <laughs> how tough it was for me. No, actually, it's very beautiful. It's very fascinating. We could even start videos about polyography. I, I I really don't hate it. I think it's a beautiful subject. Um, but it's very you know uh, it's very visual. In fact, so this presents an important um, commitment, um, and and yet that truly really makes you understand through the form of writing even the mentality that stands behind, right and naturally in the chanceries the uh, you know the, the more intense this documentation uh, was um, and uh, the, the more the, the writing had to be simplified and uh, functionalized right so there was a standardization of writing there was never fully such right probably the greatest levels of standardization were in gothic writing that were at that point fruit of a of a specific even um, categorical need for you know framing um, the the various branches you know to, to write even to 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 stuff let's say knowledge in you know in a short uh, short sp um, in a small surface right to 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 learn more to depot to depot more um, but there there was also another type of writing for the one used by notaries scribes and chancellors and also collections of uh, registers and of books that were deposited in opposite archives and um, even if we have lost a lot of this stuff uh, because uh, especially during the crisis of the 14th century the great crisis of the monasteries especially seemingly the monasteries has nothing better to do than sell their older manuscripts that would be used as a you know um, copy material for the notaries right so that uh, some of the greatest, maybe we would get uh, knowledge about, I don't know, 12th, 13th century um, literature because, you know, we have the papers of a 15th century notary that was writing on a piece of, of what had been a manuscript one day um, that still reports some, you know, some interesting note here and there. Um, some interesting information from the previous work, right? Um, there was really in the 14th century, uh, uh, an hemorrhage of this um, of, of this enorm enormous uh, amount of parchment. By the way, because those were still up to the 13th century, paper wasn't was in use. Uh, naturally, parchment preserved itself better. So the notaries actually used the, the, these uh, parchments as um, um, register covers because they were thicker, and sometimes they are in fact more worn out as well. Um, and paper preserves itself much worse, right? By the way, consider that in order to create a manuscript, you know, you, you had to butcher, I don't know how many tens of ships, even just for I don't know seventy pages. Um, and um, I uh, and think about how important writing was at that time. You don't butcher a, a sheep. Um, I mean, of course, I mean sheep got, got butchered for it, but you just think about the, you know, the cost the sheer cost uh, of working all the skin and then all putting this thing together there was a great handcraft work and just think in that sense how much that manuscript as early as the 12th 13th century was needed right as i mean that that support as it was called in order to to write on it was needed right in that regard um and um we have uh, so enough of this material actually and it, it became, since the 13th century, really habitual in every European territory, in every social strata, strata uh, the employment of um, acts that were written to keep track, memory of, of the rights of the most varied nature that were enjoyed by certain 
entities or people. And we're talking about properly property, right? Uh, exercise of jurisdictions, exemptions and privileges, um, guarantees of uh, economical activities. Um, in, in Italy, where the notary activity was uh, the, the most uh, um, widespread in Europe, this juridical documentation was written by individuals, by notaries, that acquired the so-called fides publica. That means basically the authority to validate on the legal plan the uh, subscribed uh, acts. Right. So notaries had a, an enormous, and this is not surprising because Italy at that time had the greatest trade traffic all over uh, of all Europe and also the, the, the greatest financial um, uh, uh, traffic uh, transactions so uh, these people were needed to validate this this transactions and to make them uh, you know socially you know recognizable and and uh, legitimized right and and these people as a consequence had a great value Right, uh, teachers of law received knighthood in these places, were revered because they were people who even were involved into, uh, I don't know, the public administration. We knew how to make things work in this uh, communal so societies that were very centralized in terms of public power, um, and they were deeply organized. They had different offices, functions. So these figures definitely develop where there is a greater um, uh, development in in from from that other side the events instead were narrated through annals histories chronicles the affirmation of a public authority to the emanation of laws uh, edicts statutes uh, canon collections the right concessions uh, to the redaction of diplomas privileges agreements while the governmental functions and the exercise of power were instead demanded to the uh, registration of um, judiciary, fiscal and administrative documents. The private acts such as purchasing, um, donations, uh, testaments, contracts were uh, certified by the, the notary documents management of assets and of mercantile affairs uh, was uh, recorded in inventories of goods and uh, accounting books. The circulation of news and of private relations were entrusted to certain you know papers um, the ones between authority and uh, authorities um, to the diplomatic correspondence well the um, uh, re theological, I would say, juridical and political reflections and teachings assume the form of manuals and doctrinary treatises. In the ecclesiastical world, uh, a geography, that is, the writing of the history of saints um, and the uh, collection of certain specific texts and lectionaries for, you know, for the liturgical lectures, for example, to were of great importance, uh, great importance as, and um, at the same time, as we were saying before, there was also an improvement in, in the support of the written, um, of the of, of the writing culture. As we were saying before, in medieval times, an important change was brought by uh, the transformation of the support uh, of uh, of written, of written activity for written activity the parchment for those of juridical content and greater solemnity but also for literary code literary and juridical codes while paper that was invented in china and spreading europe by muslim merchants since the 10th century first in spain then in italy uh, the 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 current and private writings were more uh, you know, were more common, right? Because paper was cheaper, and therefore also the people who voted were, on average, less affluent. Uh, but it's very complicated now because naturally everybody, even notaries, some of the highest notaries, wrote on paper. But the point is, what do you eventually do with that? Right? In the sense, uh, 
that uh, it's obviously what is written on paper on average is uh, not a throwaway document but it's still something that has less importance than a document that want to preserve on parchment that is much more resistant however uh, I think today we we talked a lot uh, as usual but still we said maybe something more just to give at least I don't know I presume that you largely know this stuff but to talk about them in general I think I, I don't find much material about this stuff on YouTube frankly I, I don't know how much people are interested properly in this stuff I mean there are people who are I, I, I tell you I also like less this kind of generalizing videos but I, I still think they are for for someone that never maybe heard or approached medieval history maybe for, for young students who have still to do it this can be helpful and can address to the other videos I make that are a bit more specific and talk about um, you know more in detail about the, this topics uh, and we will have to keep continuing to talk about uh, this in detail at one point we will gradually descend into greater um, you know into more specific uh, topics as we already do here and there but still we are floating at, at a manualistic level overall all right so I would stop you here for now and for therefore I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.